In this episode, we review the Zoom F6 audio recorder. First off, this entire episode is recorded with a Zoom F6 and a Rode NTG3 shotgun microphone, which is boomed just out of the top of the frame right here. First, what is the headline feature on the Zoom F6? What makes it special? Well, I think that really comes down to its wide dynamic range recording. Each input has two analog to digital converters. That is to say, the audio that comes out of the microphone through the cable comes into the microphone preamplifier on the Zoom F6. And then there are two separate converters that take that analog audio signal and convert it into digital. And because there are two analog to digital converters, this recorder can handle a much wider dynamic range, very, very quiet sounds to very, very loud sounds without the risk of clipping. There's no gain or trim or input setting when you're recording in this wide dynamic range mode, and it records to a 32-bit float WAV file. Most digital audio workstations and nonlinear editors can handle those with some exceptions like DaVinci Resolve, unfortunately, but this gives you the ability, if it does appear that it's clipped in post, you can actually take the audio, pull it down, attenuate it, and you'll find that all of the audio information is still there. It isn't clipped and destroyed like it typically would be with a 16-bit or a 24-bit recording. And here's a quick example. Here's an audio recording we made on the Zoom F6. This first portion here was recorded with the fader set to plus 60 dB. This section was recorded with the fader set to 0 dB. And this section was recorded with a fader set to minus 60 dB. Let's look at each section here. The first one was recorded too loud, at least if you were on a traditional recorder, this would be too loud. And that we can tell because the audio is clipping. It's all the way pegged up against zero dB here, and the waveforms are basically chopped off. If you're not familiar with what peaked or clipped audio sounds like, it's something like this. Here we're recording on the Zoom F6 with a Rode NTG3 shotgun microphone. Pretty awful. Now, the good news is that because we're working on the Zoom F6 and we recorded in 32-bit float mode, we can highlight this, pull this down, something like this. Let's play it back now. Here we're recording on the Zoom F6 with a Rode NTG3 shotgun microphone. Currently, I have the fader set to plus 60 dB. Now, if you're not familiar with recording digitally, that is normally not possible. <laughs> it's the Zoom F6's wide dynamic range recording capabilities that make that possible. Now let's see what happens here with this section that was recorded at 0 dB if we pull it up in post. So let's pull it up 15 dB, 30 dB, 30 dB. was about 32 dB. Let's see what that sounds like now. Still recording with the same setup. In this case, we have the fader set to 0 dB. Okay, sounding pretty good. And then this final section here, this was set to minus 60 dB on the fader when we recorded it. Let's see if we can recover it. Right now, there's basically nothing. There's 15 dB, 30 dB, 45 dB, and we're starting to see the waveform. 60 dB, 75 dB. almost 90 dB. Let's see what it sounds like now. I'm still recording with the Zoom F6 and the Rode NTG3. Now the difference is I have the fader set to minus 60 dB, which is pretty impressive. Now when we bumped it up here, it's gonna be somewhere in the 35 dB range, as I recall. Let's just go ahead and see what the noise floor is looking like. It's looking great, sitting down at minus 100 dB. So it's still very clean. Normally, if you were to try and pull it up this much in post, on a 24-bit recording or a 16-bit recording without this wide dynamic range recording capability, you'd pull the noise floor up too and it'd be an absolute mess. But in this case, it worked out pretty nicely. Now, one note here, you can see we did have some noise floor here. Let's see how that came out. It's still sitting at minus 65, which is really quite usable. So to give you some reference, let's go ahead and play an audio sample from the Zoom F6 along with audio samples from the Sound Devices Mix Pre 3 2 series, and that's a recorder that does also do the wide dynamic range recording, and in that particular case, you can set the gain. And then also for reference, we'll do the same recording again with the Rode NTG3 and the Sound Devices 888. 
I'm now recording on the Zoom F6 using the Rode NTG3 shotgun microphone boomed above my head about 18 inches. I do have the gain set to plus 35. Actually, it's not gain, excuse me. I have the fader set to plus 35 on the Zoom F6 for this channel, and this is what this sounds like. This is a comparison now. We're running the Rode NTG3 shotgun microphone, which is boomed just above my head here within 18 inches of my mouth, into a MixPre-3 2 Series audio recorder. Gain is set to plus 35 dB. This is what this sounds like. We are now recording with the Rode NTG3 into a Sound Devices 888. This is a pro-level recorder mixer from Sound Devices with their newest generation of preamps, just for comparison to the MixPre 3 Series 2 and also to the Zoom F6. Same location, same gain settings here. Let's just double check. I have the gain set to 35 dB and I have the microphone boom just above my head within 18 inches of my mouth. One other really neat thing about the Zoom F6 is that you can record both 32-bit float and 24-bit recordings at the same time to the same SD card. Let's talk about the microphone inputs. There are six XLR microphone line switchable inputs, and these inputs have a super low self-noise floor, specced at minus 127 dBU, which is A-weighted. Very, very quiet, so you don't have to worry about the microphone preamplifiers introducing a bunch of hiss or self-noise into your recording. There are no quarter-inch combination jacks, so you can't bring in a quarter-inch TRS cable into this, but you could use an adapter cable if you needed to. These are not instrument inputs, so it's not really for music recording, but you could use a direct box, a DI box, if you wanted to do that to bring in an instrument of some sort. There is also a USB-C input. Now you can use this to connect to your computer to use the Zoom F6 as an audio interface to record professional grade XLR based mics to your computer, or you can also use it to drive your headphones or your monitors. And through that USB-C port, you can also supply external power. So if you wanted to power the Zoom F6 with a USB battery bank, you could do that via the USB-C input. Now on the Zoom F6, there are a couple of different outputs. So of course there's a headphone output but there's also a 3.5 millimeter unbalanced output, which is spec'd at minus 10 dBV, which is consumer line level. So for those that are really interested in doing a professional kind of audio workflow, where you're gonna send balanced audio out of your audio recorder into a camera, this isn't really the best setup for that, but you can feed it definitely to consumer grade cameras that have 3.5 millimeter microphone inputs. And it works nicely for that. The dynamic range on the output is spec'd at 95 decibels A-weighted which was a little bit lower than I expected, but maybe not surprising given that this is a consumer line level output. To put that into context, the same output on the Mix Pre 2 series from sound devices comes at 115 decibels A-weighted, so there's definitely a significant difference there. The Zoom F6 has a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, and it has a roller dial that allows you to adjust the volume. It's a little bit of an awkward position, but I will say that it is easier to use than the MixPre's headphone dial if you have the recorder situated in a sound bag. Now, to be honest, this is not the best headphone amp out there. It definitely seems like more of a consumer grade headphone amplifier, and you really need to stick with headphones that have a low impedance rating. So something in the 32 ohm range is probably gonna be ideal. If you're gonna try and use your high-end headphones that have a 250 ohm rating, you're probably gonna have a hard time hearing here. In terms of powering the unit, there are a variety of different options. First of all, inbuilt to the bottom of the unit is a four AA battery sled, and you can use alkaline batteries, nickel metal hydride batteries, or lithium batteries. I'd probably recommend nickel metal hydride, which are rechargeable. What's a really nice step forward though for the Zoom F6 is that on the back of the unit, there is an integrated Sony L-series type battery sled. That's the NPF style of battery that we're used to in the filmmaking world. So that makes it so you can power the Zoom F6 for a good long time. Also, as I mentioned before, the USB-C can input power. So if you wanted to power this out in the field with a USB battery bank, you can do that. And you don't need a particularly special USB battery bank. It can be pretty much anything that can supply 2.1 amps. So a USB-A output to USB-C cable, you can get this in here and power the Zoom F6 for hours and hours. Let's talk about recording. First of all, there is one SD card slot on the back of the Zoom F6, and it can take SD, SDHC, or SDXC cards. It sits behind the L-Series battery. You can also use this as an audio interface connecting to your computer via the USB-C input here. Now, mind you, this is USB 2.0 connection, so if you think you're getting Thunderbolt here, it's not that. <laughs> it's definitely using the USB 2.0 spec. 
you can record up to 14 tracks simultaneously. So there are six inputs on the unit itself. That's where it gets its name. You can record all six of those inputs two times, once in 24-bit and once in 32-bit float, plus a stereo mix of all of the inputs. So, wow, that's a lot of recording tracks on a single recorder this size. You can also record to the inbuilt SD card and as an audio interface to your computer at the same time, which is a really nice feature as well. So that way the SD card kind of becomes your backup and you can record directly into your computer if you're doing a podcast or something of that nature. Now, the one limitation here is that you can only record up to sample rates of 48 kilohertz if you are recording to SD card and to the computer at the same time. Not a huge deal, I wouldn't think, for most spoken word content, so just something to keep in mind. You can record up to 192 kilohertz sample rates, 32-bit float, 24-bit, or 16-bit wave, and you can also record to MP3 if you wanted to do that. The Zoom F6 also supports ambisonic recording, so sort of immersive audio recording, plus it also supports mid-side stereo recording. There's a pre-record feature, so when you press the record button, it takes the several seconds prior to that and records that as part of your recording as well. And it depends on some of the settings you're using. Normally at 32-bit float, 48 kilohertz, you get a six second pre-roll time. If you go up to higher sample rates, that pre-roll time decreases. The Zoom F6 has the same auto mix feature that you would find on the Zoom F4, the Zoom F8, and the Zoom F8n. This is really useful for podcasts or panel discussions where you would prefer to have a really quick turnaround. We don't want to do a lot of work in post to get that mix just right. And what it basically does is when someone is not talking, it pulls their microphone down. So you're not picking up room noise and bleed from the other people talking into their microphone. Overall, it results in a much cleaner sounding recording. Now, I should say auto mix on the Zoom F series recorders is okay. It's nice. It's better than not doing auto mix. It's not quite as amazing or as effective as some of the higher end auto mixing that I've seen, such as on the Sound Devices Pro level recorders, they have Dugan auto mixing, which seems to work much better. But nevertheless, it's a pretty good implementation and definitely worth using if you're recording a podcast or if you're recording a panel discussion. When you are recording in 24-bit mode or 16-bit mode, the F6 also has the same advanced hybrid look-ahead limiters that you find in the Zoom F4, F8, and F8n. <laughs> These aren't my favorite, but they do actually help. And what limiters are made for, if you're not familiar with them, is that if you're recording and someone gets much louder than you expect, what typically happens in a digital recording is that, that you get clipping. You hit zero dB and it sounds distorted and awful. What a limiter does is it actually catches it before it distorts and kind of pushes it down a little bit. So it sounds much cleaner. Now, these limiters work, they're effective, but what they do is they do raise the noise floor a little bit. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. The nice thing though is with 32-bit recording, you don't need limiters anymore. The Zoom F6 also has an inbuilt time code generator. So that's a really nice addition here as well. What this allows you to do is it makes it simpler to sync up your video to your audio recordings in post if you've recorded them separately. So I'm not gonna do a whole kind of deep dive on what time code is, but I do have another video up here that has a demo where you can see exactly how that works. What we can say about the time code implementation on the Zoom F6 is it uses a 3.5 millimeter input output jack. The input is on the left channel and the output is on the right channel, which is a little weird. Thanks to Gerald Undone for pointing that out to us. That's a little bit weird in terms of jamming an external time code generator to the Zoom F6 or sending time code out of the Zoom F6 to your camera, for example, a Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. You have to use an adapter. So for example, with the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, it's expecting to get the time code on the left channel. But as I mentioned, the Zoom F6 sends time code out on the right channel. <laughs> so using this little adapter here that just sums a stereo mix into a mono, so using that adapter, you can feed the time code directly into your Pocket 4K, keep it connected throughout the whole shoot, and you're good to go. So how well does this time code generator work? It works great. I used a tentacle sync, connected that to my Pocket 4K, used the Zoom F6 inbuilt time code generator. Then when we went to go sync up in post, they synced up perfectly. So this time code generator will easily hold frame accuracy eight to 12 hours later, so not a problem. I would like to see one change though on that little input output 3.5 millimeter jack. It'd be nice if in the menus you could configure which side the time code comes out and which side it has to go in. <laughs> Just make it so you wouldn't have to buy an adapter. 
Now, the Zoom F6 doesn't support Bluetooth on its own, but you can buy a $30 Bluetooth adapter called the BTA-1. Once you've added that, you have another cool timecode feature, and that is an integration with the Timecode Systems UltraSync Blue, which is a Bluetooth timecode generator. And so what that allows you to do is actually communicate wirelessly from the Zoom F6 to this other timecode generator, and uh, it gives you a little bit more flexibility, so you can do this wireless timecode syncing. I have another video where we showed some of the features of the Timecode Systems UltraSync Blue over here. There is an iOS app for the Zoom F6, and it's actually a new app, separate from the one that is used for the Zoom F8. It requires, again, the add-on BTA-1, which runs about, again, $30 US. Now, unfortunately, this is iOS only. There is not an Android version. Please don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> I've talked about this in the past. I don't know why they don't make an Android version, but as of right now in November 2019, there is just an iOS version. The nice thing about the app is it allows you to do a whole bunch of different things. You can arm and disarm tracks. You can adjust the gain trim, the pan, the fader. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the physical controls can get out of sync and have to be swept past the software setting before they re-engage. So just something to keep in mind. That can be a little confusing at times, but that is how they work. Of course, via the app, you can enter metadata, change notes, rename the files, and a variety of other things. So really some good power there. Of course, there are really nice meters on a much larger screen, either on your phone or your iPad. You can change the record settings, but there are some things you can't do when you're connected to the app, which is a little bit weird. For example, you can't format the SD card. Overall, the build quality, this is a tiny little thing weighing in at 520 grams. It's mostly metal with plastic channel knobs and buttons. It does have a quarter 20 threaded screw hole on the bottom for mounting it to a tripod, for example. And of course, it comes with a camera bracket for the top so you can mount your camera on top of this and then attach the Zoom F6 to your tripod. Kind of a cool little setup. Really good for the solo shooter. Overall, it's pretty solid. I am really happy with the build quality overall. The only thing that may be a little bit of a weak point are those knobs on the front. I'm not really, really concerned about them. They're pretty well protected by the metal casing. And I think if you take care of it, they're gonna be just fine. Let's talk about ergonomics. Now, this is a tiny, tiny little recorder. And I think really what Zoom had in mind with it was that it was for being ultra mobile. It's for cases where you had to hide the recorder in some little corner, keep it out of sight. <laughs> and then being able to record in the wide dynamic range, you could walk away from it and not worry about clipping. But there's some kind of funky ergonomic things, but let's just kind of talk about those. Some good things too, actually. At first I felt really cramped on the front panel where basically 90% of the controls are. There's no touch screen, but the screen is very nice to read despite its small size and it's even readable in direct sunlight, so that's good. The menu buttons actually work better than I expected. Now, the nice thing about the Zoom F4, the Zoom F8, Zoom F8n is that they have a menu button and a knob that's also a button. That makes it really quick to get through the menus. On this, you have four buttons instead. And once you get used to them, it's not as bad as I thought. I think the menus are really well thought out on this. Now, it seemed like there are some settings you didn't have. So for example, on the Zoom F8 and the F8n, you had the ability to change how the meters work. You could change them to be VU meters or peak meters. On this one, you pretty much just get a peak meter that's on the dB full scale scale. So you don't have quite as many options, but I did find that the menus are really, really nicely laid out. There's no scrolling in the menus, which is really kind of interesting. And it makes it quicker to get around. So they've done a nice job reorganizing those menus. As far as ergonomics, I think one thing that some people are going to be frustrated by is the fact that the SD card slot is on the back of the unit behind the NPF battery sled. So you have to pull the battery off if you are using one to get to those SD cards. Now, I don't find that to be a huge issue because basically I only pull the card at the end of a project, but some people have cited that as an issue on some of the other recorders like the Mix Pre before. So <laughs> if that's important to you, it is behind the battery. There is also a control surface that you can connect to the Zoom F6. This is Zoom's F control. What this does is it gives you a larger control surface to work with if you're gonna be sitting at a desk or working from a cart. And so it just can make those jobs a lot easier because you have a lot more room and it's a lot more ergonomic. You can also connect a keyboard for entering metadata. So changing file names, things of that nature, adding notes. There are a couple of things that don't work exactly the same as they would on a Zoom F8, Zoom F8n or a Zoom F4. Number one, the headphone jack cable that comes with the F-Control 
doesn't work because it's quarter inch to quarter inch and you need a 3.5 millimeter output for the Zoom F6. You have to supply your own cable or your own adapter. Not a huge deal, but just something to know. Also, the F control doesn't work great in 32-bit float recording mode. So it's really kind of designed for 24-bit or 16-bit recording mode. And let me explain what I mean by that. The fader tops out at plus 12 dB, when the F control can actually go all the way up to 60 dB when you're in 32-bit float mode. So you don't have full control over the fader range if you're working with your recorder in 32-bit float mode. However, as I said, if you're in 24-bit mode or 16-bit mode, it works beautifully just like it does on the Zoom F8, Zoom F8n, and the Zoom F4. Of course, you can use a Zoom F6 as an audio interface via USB-C. You can connect it to your computer, and your computer can power the F6 while it's connected that way. I don't really use it a lot this way, but if you want to see a lot more detail about how to use it as an audio interface, I definitely recommend you go check out Gerald Undone's video, where he specifically looked at the question, can I use a Zoom F6 as both a recorder and as an audio interface? Now remember, for those musicians out there, this is probably not the number one choice. There are no high Z inputs, so if you do want to connect an instrument, you're going to need to use a DI box to make that conversion for you. There's no overdub recording either. Zoom makes a lot of other products that are probably better suited to recording music. So I think the question is, who is the Zoom F6 for? Who do I think it's really well suited for? Well, I would say for solo shooters who have to do both sound and operate camera at the same time. The wide dynamic range features on the Zoom F6 make it so that that's one less thing to worry about. Now, I am not an advocate for being sloppy, but when you are a solo operator and you have a lot of things going on, you say you're operating camera, you're operating sound, you're directing, all of that at the same time, it's a crazy job. I do it all the time. I understand the challenges. The Zoom F6 makes it so that you don't have to sweat clipping as much as you might have to in the past. And that is because of the 32-bit float wide dynamic range recording capability. Um, that's just one less worry for you. I think it's also really well suited for mobile podcasters. So again, the auto mix feature is a really great feature if you're doing that type of thing where you're going to have multiple people talking. And ideally, you want to come away with a recording that's ready to publish with as little post-processing as possible. So really nice feature on the Zoom F6, and I think it's a good fit there. So who is this recorder not for? If you're an aspiring production mixer, I would prefer the Zoom F8n or even the now discontinued Zoom F4. Ideally, the F8n with the wide dynamic range recording capabilities of the F6 would be ideal. Now, why do I say this? There are dual card slots. There's a Hiroshi input for power distribution systems. There are bigger controls, easier to navigate the menus quicker. There are just a lot of things ergonomically that make it a better fit for production sound mixing. So. That's the first thing to keep in mind. Which sounds better, a Zoom F series or a Mix Pre series? Well, we actually have an older recording on that if you want to go hear that. It's really, really close. And there are you can only hear a difference from my point of view if you're using really, really good headphones or really, really good near field monitors or speakers. It is really hard for most audiences to tell a difference. So I certainly wouldn't use that as the only factor when you're trying to decide, do I want to get a Zoom F series? or do I want to get a Mix Pre series? Now, let's talk about a few features that the Zoom F6 has that the Mix Pre series do not have. Number one, Bluetooth connection to an UltraSync Blue timecode generator. If that's important to you, only the Zoom F series have that. Auto Mix is something that the Mix Pre series doesn't have, but the Zoom F6 has. A lower price per input. So with six inputs on the Zoom F6 at $650 US, relative to the sound devices mix pre 3 which only has three xlr inputs for the same price 650 dollars you're getting a pretty good bargain with the zoom f6 i really like the integrated npf battery sled on the zoom f6 which the mix pre you have to buy an add-on battery sled to make that work and this is actually at a better angle the one on the mix pre is a little bit funky if you're going to put it into a sound bag this is going to sound really nitpicky but the reality is for me, if you're using the Zoom F6 in a sound bag, the headphone dial is easier to use because you just slide your finger down there and roll it back and forth. It's not perfect. I prefer to have it on the front just like it is on the Zoom F8n. But it's better than the Mix Pre, which has <laughs> a dial on the side, which is a little bit harder to use. Now, the new Mix Pre 2 series has a little tire they put on it, which does make it a little easier. But again, I think the Zoom F6's dial, even though it feels kind of cheap, 
it works a little bit better when it's in a bag. One thing I really appreciate about the Zoom F-Series recorders is that when you shut them down, they have a really friendly message saying goodbye. The iOS app for the Zoom F6 has the ability to adjust the gain or the trim and the faders, which is really nice because the sound device's equivalent app does not have that capability. And the Zoom F6 is less power hungry than the Mix Pre series. What I mean by that is you can actually power the Zoom F6 with a standard USB battery bank that has a 2.1 amp current output. So there are a lot of battery banks that can do that out there. With the Mix Pre, you have to have a much more powerful output with a USB-C or you have to use two separate USB-A connectors with a special Y cable to get it into the Mix Pre to get full power and full functionality. Now, on the flip side, there's some things that the Mix Pre has that the Zoom F6 does not have. Let's just run through those really quickly. First of all, the Mix Pre series has both an Android app and an iOS app. So if that's important to you, uh, that's one where the Mix Pre definitely wins. You can do backup recordings to a USB drive in the Mix Pre. And while you don't have the auto mix feature on the Mix Pre series, you do have a remix feature, which is a pretty cool little feature as well. It allows you to essentially, from a recording you've already made, make a new mix and adjust the faders to produce a better mix. The Mix Pre series has a musician's plug-in. It's an add-on that you can add to the Mix Pre that allows you to do overdub recording for multi-track music recording. So if you're creating a song and you want to use your recorder without connecting it to a computer and using a digital audio workstation, it has that capability. On the Mix Pre series, you can set the gain trim when you're in 32-bit float mode. So you have a little bit more control there which is kind of a different thing. On the Zoom F6, remember, when you're in 32-bit float mode, there is no control over the gain trim. Ergonomically, on the Mix Pre, the channel knobs are spread out a little bit more. They're also buttons at the same time that they are, you know, knobs to control either faders or gain trim or whatever you have it set up as. So that, to me, makes it a little bit easier to use under certain circumstances when you're trying to actively mix those things. Now, the knobs on the F6, they're pretty decent, but it's definitely better on the Mix Pre series. The Mix Pre series has a touch screen. Now, while the screen is probably just a tiny smidge smaller than the Zoom F6s, it is a touch screen and actually makes it pretty nice to get through those menus very quickly. The Mix Pre series of recorders have analog limiters. I find those to be superior to the digital limiters or the hybrid limiters in the Zoom F6 and the Zoom F8 and the F8n. Personal preference, I think they sound better and they don't raise your noise floor as much. So there's an advantage there as well if you are gonna be recording in 24-bit mode. The headphone output is much better on the Mix Pre and the same with the 3.5 millimeter stereo output that actually has wider dynamic range and it produces a stronger signal. So there are some advantages there on the Mix Pre side. So in the end, I think it's really important to remember and keep in mind that you can create fantastic recordings with either of these, the Zoom F6 or the Mix Pre 2 series. I'm not here to say you need to buy one or the other. I'm sorry, I think some people would like me to tell them that just to make the process easier for them. But just think about those different features that we just reviewed here and see what is more important to you and then that can help you make your decision. Now, some people will say, Curtis, you're not taking a stand, you're wimping out. Fine, if you're gonna back me into a corner, I would probably choose for me, subjective opinion, because I do sound mixing from a sound bag on the productions that I work on in a lot of cases, I would probably choose the Mix Pre. That being said, I purchased the Zoom F6 with my own money. No regrets purchasing it. It's a fantastic recorder. I'm really impressed with all the things you can do with it. And I think it's the right fit for a lot of people. So hopefully that was helpful for you. If you have any questions, go ahead and leave those down below. And if you've not already subscribed, make sure you do that. And we'll be sure to get you more great videos on how to improve your lighting and sound for video. Talk to you soon.